Hey there, uh, this video is going to cover topic 3.3, uh, random sampling and data collection. Our learning objectives are to identify a sampling method given a description of a study, and we're going to be going over four different sampling methods in this video. And then we're going to discuss why a particular method is or is not appropriate uh, for a given situation. So let's first begin by talking about uh, sampling without replacement. Uh, this, I would say, is probably uh, done the majority of the time. So when we sample without replacement, items from the population can be selected only once. Uh, so you can see in this little diagram here that there are <clears throat> uh, 10 items in our population. And the first selection was item number five. But when we go to look at the next selection, um, item five is no longer available to be selected. It's been removed from the population and has not been replaced, which means the next item has to be something different, something unique, which happens to be seven. Okay. So every time we select an item from the population, it is removed and is no longer available for selection again. <clears throat> uh, sampling with replacement uh, means that items can be selected more than once. So this time, Okay, item five was the first item selected from the population, and you can see that it's available to be selected again, right? But it wasn't, you know, item seven was selected, but it was possible that item five could have, could have been selected twice. Um, so here, this kind of illustrates the different results you can get depending on whether you replace or not. Okay, so if you don't replace, then your sample will consist of only unique items. Um, but if you do replace, then your sample could contain repeats. Right, so here, the purple item was selected twice from the population. Okay. Without replacement, every item is unique or different. Okay, so let's get into the four uh, kind of methods that you need to know for the AP exam as far as sampling. Uh, the most basic, which is the foundation for all the other methods, is the simple random sample, uh, which we uh, abbreviate as SRS. Okay. So uh, with this method, every group of a given size has an equal chance of being chosen. Uh, so you can see here in the diagram that a group of five has been chosen. Okay. But any group of five could have been chosen right, and would have an equal chance of being chosen with this method. Okay. So how do we carry it out? Um, well, kind of the, the most simplest way is to put names in a hat and pull out five names. right, And we would understand that if the names are all on similar size slips of paper and mixed well, that any group of five names could be pulled from the hat. Okay. Um, another way to do it is to use a random number generator. So we could assign every uh, uh, individual uh, in the population a number and then generate five random numbers and select those five individuals. Right, uh, method number two is called the stratified random sample. And so it's a kind of three-step process. You first divide the population into separate groups, which we call strata, uh, based on some shared attributes or characteristics. So maybe you wanna divide the population into uh, male, female. Uh, maybe you wanna divide your population uh, into, um, for instance, like in a high school, you might wanna divide it into grade levels. So you'd have four strata. Uh, freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors. Um, there's lots of ways you can divide the population. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, within each of those stratum or subgroups, you perform an SRS. Okay, so you pull names out of a hat, you know, uh, say this, this is male, female, so pull uh, two names out of the male hat and pull three names out of the female hat. And then you combine the selected units to, to form the final sample. <clears throat> Uh, cluster sampling uh, also requires dividing the population into smaller groups, but we call these groups clusters. And uh, ideally, uh, within each cluster, there is hetero heterogeneity, right? Meaning that each cluster uh, kind of mirrors what we see within the population just on a smaller scale. Okay, so there's a, a good mix of individuals within each cluster. Um, and that way, the clusters are kind of similar to one another. They're just, they look like the population on a smaller scale. Um, and then instead of selecting individual units, we select entire clusters. 
So we would perhaps number the clusters one to five and then uh, pull two numbers out of a hat. And those would be the clusters that we would then select. And then we collect data from all units in that cluster. <clears throat> so this, this uh, method is unique in that we don't select individual units, but we select uh, entire clusters at a time. All right, the fourth and final method is the systematic random sample. Uh, and this uh, selects uh, members according to some random starting point and then uh, a fixed periodic interval. So you can see here in the, uh, in the graphic that every third person is being selected. Right? So they probably randomly chose one of the first three people. And then at that point, they just chose every third person afterwards. <clears throat> Um, then there's a census, which attempts to select all items from the population. <clears throat> Generally, this is uh, very difficult to carry out, especially if the population is, is large, like uh, populations of entire nations. Uh, it's hard to perform a census. It requires a lot of time and a lot of money, and a lot of effort. <clears throat> all right, so let's go back to the four uh, you know, main sampling methods that we went over in this video and talk about some of their advantages or in some cases disadvantages. Okay. So I'm not gonna say much about the simple random sample. It is kind of uh, th the basis or the foundation for you know, these other three methods. <clears throat> so the stratified sample uh, has an advantage in, in that it tends to produce samples that are more representative of the population, which then leads to more precise estimates. So for instance, if we were trying to conduct a survey at a high school, right, we can maybe do a simple random sample where we uh, select, I don't know, 100 students from the school at random, okay? But there's no guarantee that that 100 students is gonna represent all four grade levels, you know, equally or proportionally, right? Because it's entirely random, we might get a sample that's predominantly freshman, right? In which case it doesn't quite reflect uh, or represent the entire population. But if we stratify first and say, okay, well, we know we're sampling at a high school and we know we want all grade levels to be represented proportionally. So let's go ahead and divide the school into four groups based on grade level. And then we can sample 25 students from each grade level, right? And then we have kind of equal or fair representation from all grade levels, right? We, we're kind of guaranteeing ourselves that our sample will reflect all four grade levels equally or if you want proportionally. <clears throat> um, the cluster sample uh, has the advantage in that it saves time and money uh, because it selects individuals that are close together. So you don't have to go uh, to great distances or great lengths to, to, to select your individuals. Uh, you're not spending a lot of time locating them uh, because you're only selecting people who are close together. So <clears throat> again, if we think about a high school setting, uh, right at our high school, we have the uh, Patriot, Patriot Plus period. <clears throat> so if we wanted, we could say select two Patriot Plus classes, maybe three, right? And maybe our goal is to get 100 students. So if we imagine about 30 something students per class, then we would select about three Patriot Plus classes and then collect data from all students in those classes. Right? And that saves us a lot of time because we only need to go to three locations to collect data on 100, uh, roughly 100 students. Whereas if you were to do a simple random sample, you might have to go to 100 different locations to collect data on 100 different individuals. And that also could be true about the stratified sample. Right? You might have to go to 100 different locations. But with clustering, you significantly reduce the number of locations that you have to go to to collect your data. <clears throat> Um, so this is best used if you can uh, group together individuals based on them being in similar locations. The systematic uh, sample uh, has an advantage is in that it could be easier to conduct. So uh, this is often used in like exit polling uh, during election. So as people come out of the polling center, uh, you maybe uh, survey every 10th person or every 20th person. Uh, this is useful because you might not know how many total people are going to be there that day. <clears throat> um, 
So you couldn't do a simple random sample on number of people if you don't know how many people they're going to be. Um, so a systematic sample would work good there. It also works well like with um, like products coming down an assembly line, <clears throat> right? Like electronic devices or something. Maybe you just sample every tenth one uh, because they're coming out in a specific order. Uh, the systematic sample may be easier to conduct than say a simple random sample. Um, there is one caveat though, which is uh, if there happens to be a pattern in the way that those items are ordered within the population and that pattern coincides with uh, the order that you're selecting them systematically, then you might not have good representation. <clears throat> so if you think maybe like in an assembly line process, right, the products are coming out in batches of 10 or something, and maybe the last item in every batch, uh, you know, doesn't, is a little different, right? Maybe there it's like underfilled or something, right? Maybe it's, uh, you know, bags of potato chips. They're coming out in batches of 10, uh, but the last bag in every batch is maybe underfilled because of the machinery. I don't know. And if you systematically select every 10th bag, right, then you're always going to select the bag that's underfilled, right? And that doesn't, doesn't accurately represent your population. So that's kind of an extreme case. Um, but yeah, it could happen. So we need to be aware of that as well. Okay. Um, so that pretty much concludes uh, kind of this basic introduction to uh, random sampling and kind of the four uh, sampling methods that you need to be aware of on the AP exam. <clears throat>